Have a seat. I'll start. Right, am I on? Okay, welcome everybody. It's great to be here. We've got a lot to get through. Um, I won't dwell because time is tight, so we go straight on. Start with this. Our objective as Wikimedia is, as it says there, uh, a world where every single person has free access to the sum total of human knowledge online, and it's used for educational purposes, training, learning, call it what you wish, but a promotion of cultural heritage, which I suppose is most germane to today, and um, that's what we're doing. Our impact, our size of uh, the Wikimedia project is pretty huge. <coughs> this I pulled off um, Alexa the other night, uh, alexa.com. This is where we sit there. Normally we um, say we're sort of fourth or fifth, but I suppose it depends on the day. But that particular day it was that. You'll see also um, here, the, the English Wikipedia, which is relevant to us, has at the moment, or the other day, 3,728,319 articles and 24,890,000 pages, and also in excess of one billion edits. So Wikipedia is one hell of a project. What's the relevance to Bristol? Well, we've been very busy in Bristol over the last 15, 16 months. We hosted the 10th anniversary, our birthday party here in January at the University of Bristol. Um, and also, we, Jimmy Wales spoke at the Bristol Cathedral Choir School. So we were beginning a relationship with the school's side of things as well. We have currently a Wikimedia in residence at Archive Wildscreen, which is over by um, King Street, um, just for the summer. He is helping develop a biodiversity project in relation to what the archive people have kindly donated to us, which is not the images, by the way, it's just the text. We're hoping to persuade them over the course of time to denote, donate more about, obviously it's about building relationships and networking. Also, we've got currently a Wikimedia outreach ambassador for the University of Bristol, who are funding it, not us. We did a BBC Bristol, thank you very much guys, they're here, um, Wikipedia Academy. Uh, we've also just recently tried to address one of our problems in Bristol, which is um, getting a, a gender balance between the editors and the users. So we're really, really, really keen and enthusiastic to get as many women involved as possible, because at the moment, the last surveys have us stacked up as 87 male and 13 female, and that's not very healthy. So that's why we want events on, and anybody here that's keen to organise, get in touch with me afterwards. Also, um, next week, I'm going to plug an edit-a-thon that we're doing at the Watershed with Archive, which is learning how to edit, etc. Moving on, there's just some of what we did. There's some pictures. After the 10th birthday with Jimmy, there he is, um, we had something like 700-plus Google um, News articles the following morning, which I think was a success for Bristol, putting Bristol on the map, which is a, really what this is about. But here, can we help put, put Bristol on the global map longer term? That's why we want to talk to you today. Now, I suppose it's over to you now, Roger, is it not? Can be. Yeah, I'm going to take the, the lovely, comfortable seat there and enjoy the remaining bit, and then I'll come up and conclude at the end. But Roger's going to tell you all about Derby Museum and what we did for them. Right. Um, we, we looked on the internet and I was looking at Bristol and looking at Bristol Museum and I knew I was coming to the M Sheds. So I looked and found on the M Shed, I was looking for a free image of the M Shed. I was quickly looking for a picture. This is the best picture I could find that's got a free license. It's not a particularly impressive picture of the M Shed, but because of the fact that museums like to protect their pictures and make sure that they're not freely licensed, when people are looking for a free license picture, they have to go for the best one they can find. Um, I looked on, the, um, on Wikipedia to find out what the M-Shed's like. There's no picture. There's a few words. Basically, it looks like a very small museum. Um, not very impressive at all. Um, I went and also went and looked at, because I used to live here, I looked at the Bristol Industrial Museum. The Bristol Industrial Museum is a much more impressive museum on Wikipedia. It's got a lot more information about it. It's got a lot more pictures. If I was looking for a museum to visit, I would visit the Bristol Industrial Museum. And you guys spent £27 million trying to transform that into the M Shed, but when you actually look on the internet, it's hardly there. So, one of the points which we're making here is about the fact that Wikipedia fills gaps. If there is a space where there isn't information, then you generally tend to find that Wikipedia fills that gap. 
So for instance, BBC Wildlife Finder, if you look on the BBC Wildlife site, if they haven't got information, they'll take it from Wikipedia. If you look on um, Radio 6, if they want information on a jazz singer, they take it from Wikipedia. Um, if you Facebook, if there's a Facebook page for somebody famous and they haven't got the information, they take it from Wikipedia. We always fill the gap. Um, in M Shed's case, we are filling the gap with a very small article. Um, Glam is a title that we use. It comes from Australia. It talks about, talks about um, galleries, libraries, archives and museums. So we're very interested in this part of the cultural heritage because we can see the fact that Wikipedia grew up as an amateur product project with a few people trying to write down what they knew. It's now pretty much come of age. If you look at it, you kind of go, that's pretty much all I know on that subject. You actually need an expert to actually improve most of our pages now. Um, so we'd like to get the libraries involved and the museums involved to make sure that we have got experts. Um, and we want to inspire volunteers to work with the museum, as, as um, Steve was saying earlier. We've got people working here. We partner Derby Museum. We've par partnered the, Brist the British Museum, the British Library, all the big names, the V&A, but we thought we'd pick on one small museum and give it a lot of national attention, even international attention, into one museum just to see what kind of effect we could have on a museum, how we could affect its profile. Um, when we started, Derby Museum, well, it's a small regional museum. It's three stories, there's about 15 employees, it's got some Joseph Wright paintings, but it's a pretty unremarkable museum. If it isn't raining, we don't get many visitors. Um, the wiki article, to be honest, was bigger than the M Sheds article, but the M Sheds article is embarrassingly small. Um, um, after one meeting, we, we, we invited in Wikipedians to, to, to work with Derby Museum, and as a result of the, meeting, me, of the meeting, we had about 10 or 20 extra articles written on it, and the Derby Museum was spread to about a dozen languages, because obviously we're not just interested in English, there are Wikipedians, Wiki Wikipedias in about, oh, somewhere about 150 different Wikipedias. You see the English one, but there's one in practically every other language you're, you're talking about. So there's one in Anglo-Saxon and Latin and all the other languages that you know about. Um, Derby Museum was mentioned, we, we started to include 40 objects. The reason why we, we're interested in including objects is because that's what actually defines a museum. It's not the building, it's, it's actually what's in it. So we want people to be, have an object, to be able to see what's inside the the museum, but we wanted to do more. So that was, that was quite good, but we wanted to do more for this one museum. We knew that museum curators love writing labels. They think it's part of their job. It's kind of, this is what we do. We write labels very well. Um, and sometimes they write them in more than one language, but obviously they've got a problem there because of funding and, and time and, and space because you don't actually want to see a, a massive space of, of uh, information in front of you. And we were told that we would never be allowed, Wikipedians would be, never be allowed to write museum labels because we'd be putting people out of work and et cetera, et cetera. But we did want to do it. So because we got this relationship with our museum, they said, we will allow you to put QR codes in our museum. Um, we'd never allow, been allowed ever to put QR codes in the museum. I'm guessing most of you guys have seen these things. I'll give you a demonstration of what they are in a moment. Basically, they're a link to a URL. So you've got the, one of these with your mobile phone, click on it, and it tells you all the information you want to know from a particular URL. Um, we wanted to put these in, and we wanted to make sure that we were able to edit, the, edit the, the, the information that was actually available on these coming from these QR codes, which we thought was pretty amazing doing this, because we've now got people inside a museum accessing information that's coming from outside the Wikipedia, and we've got Wikipedians in Indonesia editing stuff that's inside the Arby Museum. It's kind of pretty, pretty cool but we wanted to do something better. We wanted to do different languages. So we got a museum, we got a, a volunteer consultant involved. We invented a brand new product, this thing called QRpedia. Um, we built a website. Um, basically, what this allows you to do is you click on the object there. It tells you about the object that you're looking for in the museum, but it also senses the fact that you're French because your phone is set to the French language or you're German and it's set to the German language. So it gives you the information about that object in the language of your phone. So you've got, suddenly you've got foreign visitors coming around the M shed and going, whoa, it talks to me in Polish. That's amazing. And I didn't even have to tell them that I was Polish. It's just kind of, that's brilliant. Um, so it redirects the, the correct article. So here we have 
just showing you how it works. Here we've got Derby Museum's article. I'm not too sure what language we're in. Um, somebody might be able to spot the language. I think we're in German. Um, I'm going to show you how these QRpedia codes work. Basically, you, you put, have one of these by your object. You come in, a bit tacky here. We've got a mobile phone, a virtual one. Just to make sure it senses the picture, the photo, and it clicks off and takes you to the language of the phone. So in here, we're talking about Japanese. So we've got the, the object in the museum being, being clicked on, and it's going to the language of the phone, in this case, Japanese. Um, we've got a problem here now, because now we've got a brilliant technology, but how do we find all this extra information in German and Polish and Japanese and all those languages which we'd like to support so that people can come around the museum? How are we, how are we possibly going to do that? It's going to cost a fortune. What we did was we set up the right challenge. For those people who don't know, Joseph Wright is the, the painter in, in Derby. So that's the reason why it's called the right challenge. We decided to give out prizes of a £50 voucher. Not a great deal of money. A couple of books. We advertised it on 140 Wikipedias. So we just put a little advert on all the Wikipedias going, how would you like to write articles on Derby Museum? I know you've never heard of it, but come and do it anyway. We launched it on May the 1st. Within a week, we got 100 articles written about items in Derby Museum in obscure languages. We actually got collateral benefit out of it. Besides people writing about objects in the museum, they started writing articles about nearby, museum, nearby bridges, nearby churches. They started writing about paintings that they thought were in Derby but actually are in the, uh, one of the National Galleries in, in London. Um, they started writing about stuff that was actually in the stores and wasn't actually being shown. And they even started writing about uh, people from the 19th century who used to work for the British. So it's kind of, whoa, lots of in information bit coming in there and on the museum. Um, we made the front page of the main Wikipedias. I guess most people here have seen the front page of the English Wikipedia, but the French Wikipedia is quite big too, and so is the Russian Wikipedia and the Polish Wikipedia. Here we've got Derby Museum on the front page of the uh, top one, left one there is the English Wikipedia, then we've got the Russian Wikipedia, and we've got the French Wikipedia. It's giving us more hits to Derby Museum's web page. So it's actually going from our page, clicking through to their web page. It's fulfilling our mission to educate and, and to share information around the world. And it's raising the interest and status of the city. So I'm going to hopefully can talk a bit more about that, how that affects the city, because people actually see giving money to museums as just kind of a a waste of money, if you like. It, that'll take care of the old people on a rainy day. Actually, your museum funding can actually be a benefit to the city. So here we've got... It's a painting. It's that, this painting isn't actually on show in Derby Museum. Um, it's, um, it was written by a guy in France who'd never actually been to Derby. It was translated into English, then to Russian. It was on the Russian main page, and 53,000 people, not saw the article, read the article. So they clicked on it and actually went and read about it. So that's, that's an incredible impact in another country just from doing a bit of work on Wikipedia. This was the number of articles we wrote. 1,200 different articles in Russian, Catalan, two types of Belarusian, Italian. For some reason, no German. I don't know why, but that's what you get with volunteers. They do what they want to do, and sometimes the Germans don't want to join. But we had 1,200 articles. <laughs> Who wrote them all? This is where they were. So people all across the world. Lots of people in Western Europe, but the Portuguese articles were written in Brazil. The Spanish articles were written in Mexico. The person who put together all the um, sorting of the database of the pictures and things lives in California. Um, lots of Japanese articles um, and quite a lot written in, 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 in Indonesia. So an Indonesian can wander around Derby Museum, click on lots of items and have it talk to them in Indonesian. Um, we're also doing something for the tourist industry. So here we've got Joseph Wright Day. It's a big event in Derby. We were on four main pages. The mayor was giving out prizes to people in, in five different countries. And we were on the French Wikipedia three times. So Bristol, how can we get onto Google? Improving the city's Google position on the web. We've got 1,200 links in Derby. From, so, and you, the position on, the, on Google is determined by the number of links you've got. So the more links you've got, the higher you go up, up, go up the ratings. Um, and on non-English Wikipedias, if you search for a museum in the UK, 
I suspect the M Shed is not going to be in the top five. But Derby Museum, smaller than this one, possibly up there with the British Museum going, we're famous because we have got lots of articles written in Ukrainian and therefore on the Ukrainian Wikipedia, we're an important museum. Who put Bristol on the map? If you looked on the French Google map, I haven't looked on the French Google map, but if you haven't got an article in French, how are people, French people going to want to know about the, when they click on Bristol, they're going to see the M Shed, going to be able to see information about it? I don't think so because you haven't got any information in French. Um, so in conclusion, these QR codes that we're putting on things that add value, they, they cost nothing, tons. Um, Wikipedia pages are very easy to update and we'll get them updated from around people around the world. Smartphones you know about. Language support is possible using this QRpedia idea. It opens up your ultra ethnic city. You've got 32,000 Somalis in this country, in this, in this city. Um, they would possibly be stunned to find out that they can actually go around their museum and see their information in their language. Um, and the curators create global impact. So actually they go, go from, we didn't want you to write our labels, to suddenly, ooh, people in Russia are seeing my stuff and I'm famous. Which is quite a kind of good way to turn the museum inside out, which is like a phrase I'd like to use. I'm just going to ask Steve to finish and tell you a bit more about, a bit more impact about. Yeah, just very quickly. Um, am I on? Very quickly, um, we just saw this example from a couple of years back. Fantastic global footprint for Bristol, an amazing thing. 120,000 people queued in one month to see it. Um, more people viewed this. If you'd have combined the two and had that being translated into God knows how many languages, you wouldn't have had, um, as it was earlier, what was the number? 120,000 people in a month. You could have had millions because that really did put Bristol on the map. But by God, if we'd had that in 250 languages, it would have been on the world map. And that's how I think we could involve everybody across the city, whatever um, race, colour, creed they are, in writing the content. The museums could fulfil their desire to do that outreach that they're desperate to do for the cost of a piece of laminate and uh, a piece of sticky paper which they could put right in the discreet corner of every one of their exhibits. It's a phenomenally cheap, very, very imaginative way to absolutely energise a city and put a city on a map. And um, there you go. We just imagined it in Arabic. Bop. Technology transforms museums. Museums can change a city. Thank you. Hope we're not over time. Thank you.